Hello, and welcome to my Therapist Plays Disco Elysium analysis series. So on today's episode, I'm very excited because we are finally getting to use one of my absolute favorite frameworks for analyzing characters. This is something that I use in therapy from time to time, and it's an incredible way to explore patterns of psychology and patterns of behavior and sort of really uncover what is driving a lot of the complexes that we see play out in um, Harry's thoughts and his actions. And the reason we are doing that now is because we are starting to learn more about ourselves and our past. We're going to take another look at that ledger and see what do we actually think about the person that we used to be before we became a sorry cop. All that's coming up, so let's jump back in. Oh, there it is. There it is. We are back. We are so back. And I'm so excited. Okay, so we are back in the game now. I just wanted to say uh, the community that has arrived around like this game and specifically this playthrough continues to amaze me, especially after last episode was like a lot of politics talk and I was very like anxious avoidant of <laughs> talking about politics. I have been very encouraged by the response to that last episode to like not be so anxious about it. Um, I don't, I still don't know if I'm going to like <laughs> start getting full political, but I will try not to like avoid it in the game because of my personal issues with, with getting political. I'll just say that. I, I won't let it divert the game because at the end of the day, I want to talk about like mental health and there's probably some interesting avenues in the, the narrative of the game that we'll miss out on if I just totally ignore it. However, I will say this game is so wonderfully designed that it you have a main character who has a real backstory. He's not like a blank slate like I thought that he was going to be from the beginning. He has his own backstory. And at the same time, it allows you to have your own beliefs and, and, and to, and the character will like have the same behavioral patterns. Like genuinely imagine if like literally Brady was the detective. Imagine if, <laughs> what you know about me so far, how I would go about solving a murder would be exactly like you've seen it. Like I would spend <laughs> crazy amounts of time on things that you just wouldn't like you <laughs> you wouldn't think have the significance that they do and uh i would be t i would totally overlook lots of stuff and and my priorities would just be a total mess that's why i'm not a detective <laughs> i genuinely don't think i would be good at it however i am a detective of the mind that's actually something i Encourage pretty often to my clients um, is to be detectives of their own minds because, like, what does a detective do, right? They they show up to a crime scene and they do not just immediately like make a claim about like who did it. They don't just show up and they're like, it was <laughs> it was the butler or whatever. They they canvass the scene. They take in the evidence. They uh, talk to witnesses right and like you should be doing the same thing when you arrive on the scene of a new emotion where you're like oh that that really made me mad it must be because that person is an idiot no like investigate that a little more right um do some do some detective work of why you might be feeling that way and you, you know your first impulse may be correct it may have been the butler but uh sometimes it is the butler Sometimes uh, sometimes you show up to the scene and you realize that you're the murderer, which judging by the, the twists and turns that this game has taken, I would not be surprised if we killed or were involved in some way in the murder. Now, I also want to talk about the dream sequence that we saw at the end of last episode. I was a little too tired to really talk about it. Um, very haunting scene. Something that I really took away from it 
is like I've been getting the sense as we wander through Revishal and stumble upon things like, you know, the, our room, people we've pissed off, our missing gun, the bottles on the um, rooftop and stuff. Like I had, I had the suspicion that we were not happy with who we were. Pretty evident, right? But the dream sequence scene was like really hammering that home visually for me because here we have Harry hanging from the tree from a disco ball, which was pretty cool and very thematic. Um, and he's talking about, like, he says something like, you've uh, billions of people in the world and you failed every single one of them. And that kind of inner dialogue, like if I'm imagining that this is someone's conceptualization of themselves, like this is past Harry, the drunken hanging corpse is like who he feels like he was before all of this, right? And so genuinely, a lot of my work is on like reauthoring narratives about yourself and um learning to be kind to yourself and so like i think it would be very pertinent to investigate that side of harry right like in in a therapy session or multiple therapy sessions like when you th i would the kinds of questions i would ask would be like so let's say I, they harry came in and he said well i had a dream last night that i was you know the hanged man and whatever else um you know my my line of questioning would be kind of like what do you feel about this person that you saw what kinds of ideas do you have about them and he might say well i hate him i'm afraid of him right this would start putting us on to like well what is your relationship to this person because like there's a very different kind of emotional posture you could have to say, well, I hate that person. When I see him hanging from the tree, I feel like he deserves this versus I feel so sorry for that person. When I see him from the hanging, hanging from the tree, I feel so much regret. One of those is a path to self-empathy, right? And healing. And the other one is like, you just want to forget this person. But I don't think that that would be as helpful to just forget. Um, we cannot just one day to the next, like, okay, well, I'm just going to be a different person. I think it's fine if he wants to reinvent himself and be someone new. But like, part of really making it clear what virtues you want to develop today is knowing specifically the kinds of bad qualities you're running away from. And if you just close the book and say, no, there's nothing worth looking into here. I hate that person. He deserves this. Then you will miss out on that deeper sense of clarity. To know truly how bad things were is, is to give you guidance for what to work on. And a lot of that is going to come down to learning to love yourself. He is still on his journey of self-discovery, which is why we have not looked in the mirror yet. And uh, I don't think I'm ready to, frankly. We just saw our past self, like hanging from a tree, bloated, drunk, dying. And this was so shocking to myself and my character that I feel like it's the first inclination to like wanting to learn more, but we're not ready to, to say definitively, like, am I happy with the person that I am instead of that person? Like I'm got, I may look in the mirror, but I, I just don't think he's ready yet. <laughs> I know that that's killing some people inside, but this one's really important to me because like, that's one of the first options that you get. And I've approached it several times and I just got the feeling that like, it's not time. Maybe you're a vampire. Could be. I love that the game is uh, giving me the option. 
Question, how do you interpret dreams in your profession? That's a good question. I don't generally, like, I'm not a, the only reason I don't is because I'm not, like, an expert on dreams by any means. Um, if someone comes into the session and they are talking about a dream and I guess my approach to dreams is, like, let's say I'm working with someone on their relationship with their mom. And then they come in and they're like, I had a dream about mom. I'm like, okay, well, let's, that's good. Like, let's process that. What did it feel like? What did, what was the situation in the dream? Why do you think your mind was going there? All these things, right? I, I guess what I'm saying is that, like, my intention to analyze dreams is when there is, like, already context to that subject in the sessions. If someone comes into my therapy session is like, so last night I had a dream where like, and they just start telling me randomly random stuff and it's not related to anything that we're working on. I, I'm not going to like, so let's unpack that. You know, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, I don't know. I'm not like super well versed on like what things mean. I'm more of, I, I will unpack it to say like, okay, so you had a dream that um, you were in an argument with your mom and she was wearing your shoes. Like, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> it's just is random stuff. Um, what, what does it make you feel to talk about that right now? Like, I'm going to bring it present. I'm not going to be able to make an objective analysis about what it means. What I can do is grapple with like, well, what does it mean to you that you saw this? Like, what do you interpret from it? And is that useful? Sometimes it is. Okay, so we are on day two, finally. And uh, it is once again my objective to progress the game and solve the murder. We have to solve this murder. Good morning, Kim. Let's uh, let's get him involved for this sprightly morning. Morning. Love a love a just one of those quick nod. I've got some good news. I took care of the body. The thought of him decomposing in my MC wouldn't let me sleep. Okay, I took care of the body. Yeah, I know we missed out on um, some of that narrative, but I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. Good. Well, let's uh, let's see what happens. I don't know if I was ready to let him go. Well, he's in processing now. We have other matters to attend to. I'm okay with that. He kind of wishes you'd acknowledge this contribution, but you've missed your opportunity now. Fuck. And now I'm invested in like uh, the being Kim are on a good trajectory. Now I'm worried about disappointing him further. The union muscle finally turned up and they look rowdy. We need to talk to them. Okay. What do you mean rowdy? I mean ungovernable. Martinez isn't exactly enthusiastic about the RCM being here. They prefer to be policed by the union. These men here, men who drink beer for breakfast, there's talk of an armed wing of the Union called the Hardy Boys, who are responsible for state policing. I think it's them. That's a great word, ungovernable. <laughs> well, look, that's what happens in real life sometimes. You you say something with one intention, and then the other person, like... You read into it that they are disappointed in your response. And then you just have to move on. That's just life. Why do we need to talk to them? Everything points to the Dock Workers Union. The belt used for hanging him, tracks in the mud, the circumstances in Martinez, my preliminary information. Which may, of course, all be wrong. But we still need to talk to them, and it won't be easy. Okay. Are these the men Gart told us about? I completely forgot. Sorry, I had a rough night's sleep. It's them by the looks of it. Loud and nasty, just like the manager said. So Kim may have been having some of his own disturbing dreams. One loose thread less to worry about, and one big problem to replace it. Okay. 
There's so many of them. Maybe we should call in reinforcements. That would just escalate tensions. No captain would sign off on it. Solving one murder isn't worth a conflict between the RCM and the Debarders Union. Okay. In fact, even the death of two detectives might not warrant an all-out war. So let's keep a cool head, okay? Okay. Kiv is telling me to keep a cool head. <laughs> let's He's see how that goes. exaggerating about that mortal danger. Just calmly factoring it in. Your fists clench and your pulse rises uncomfortably. Why? Why Half-Light? Do I... I, I, am I scared? I'm scared of what's going to happen. I'm scared of myself that I won't be able to control my urges to, to fight them. Let's roll. One more thing before we do. We don't have to talk to them immediately. We can walk right past them, continue with our business. Ooh, okay. So we can go on a bit of a side quest binge, I guess. Good. A power move. Purposefully concentrate on something else first. <laughs> Look, I love a good power move. Yeah, streetwise. Zoom right past. Do it on your own terms. Yeah, boy. They're in no hurry to leave. They think they own the place. Anyway, I leave that choice to you. Whatever you decide is fine by me. Okay. <laughs> Look, I... I want to progress the storyline. But I also have a lot of things I need to do. There are so many things, okay? We're not obsessed with getting our smokes. We've sort of resolved that one. I'm going to need some more money. I will, I'm sure we'll find that along the way. <laughs> I need to make a truce with Kuno. That's a priority. That's a big priority for me. I have to offer him something, so... I don't have that book in my possession. It's the Jan Mystery. Okay. There's a lot of things I could do. I mean, I guess none of these are really a priority. Let's see what Lena's up to. Let's get let's get her perspective on all this. Just a moment. And there's no public phones nearby. The closest phone booth is down the coast. Sorry for the inconvenience, ma'am. Uh, that's not just an inconvenience, friend. You, 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 you better not do anything to make Lena's uh, day any worse. It's fine. I understand. Thank you anyway. I'm glad to see you again, dear. Gosh, she's so understanding. The lady is distressed. Perhaps something more upbeat might cheer her up. <laughs> Howdy, Lena. What's kicking? Uh, no. Uh, why is it giving me options to say these things? Good day, ma'am. Everything all right? Sorry, ma'am. I didn't mean to eavesdrop on your conversation. Tell me how I might make it up. That's very polite. It's very sorry, cop. Let's go with that. Please don't trouble yourself about me, sweetie. I was just hoping to make a call, but the Whirling's phone line isn't working. Hey, raffle mouse. Thank you. Thank you for subbing with Prime. It's very much appreciated. The union office probably has a phone, but I can't really get there. Or to the phone booth down the coast. And Gary's phone is dead, too. What's wrong with the phone line? Who did this? The manager this? was vague about it. He was vague, you say? Now I gotta ask the question. Why did you need to use the phone? To let the young woman who's house-sitting for us know that we may be delayed. Morel, my husband, and our friend Gary were supposed to get back by Monday night. But they're still missing, and I haven't heard from them. Interesting. Okay. So Gart may be involved in their disappearance. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Look, you gotta ask yourself who benefits. In, in times like this, the phone line just suddenly goes down right when right when sweet Lena needs it. Come on now. I don't I don't see how those dots connect naturally. I was also hoping she'd heard from Morel. Hmm. You hear that? Someone's missing. There could be foul play. I knew it. I knew it. I love missing persons cases. 
That's right. Now skip the foreplay. Time to dive into the dark alleys. Start shaking down the usual suspects. You know, legwork. Yes. Doing some good will alleviate the hangover. At least you're of use to someone. Thank you, Volition. I appreciate the encouragement. This sounds more like a side thing. I need to take care of my main thing. No, this is the main thing right now. <laughs> okay, I'll bite. Has your husband gone missing before? That's just it. This isn't like him at all. He always Can't be a coincidence. plans his expeditions so carefully. A cold breeze hisses through dense thickets of reeds. Something sweet in it, somnolent. A damp mm. chill goes down your spine. When you look around, you're still in the whirling in rags. But you have more important things to worry about. Don't, don't do that to yourself, Lena. Tell me more. What was this expedition he was Just on? Some field work, sweetie. Morel is a highly trained scientist. He and his assistant Gary are studying an extremely rare species of insect. Okay. But they should have returned by now. They were just going down the coast across the water lock to set a few traps. He said they'd be back on Monday. What could oh, be shit. keeping them? So they've been missing for like some time. Hmm. Who's this Gary person? Oh, sweetie, it's nothing like that. Gary's as loyal as they come. I trust him with my husband's life any day. What about the traps? I doubt it, sweetie. The traps aren't big enough for humans to get caught in them. They're for the insect. Anyway. Do it. Find him. This will surely lead to a mystery with that extremely rare insect. This sounds like police business. I'll help you find your husband. Are you sure we have time to go chasing after bug <laughs> just now? I did suggest we play it cool, but... Hey, Kim, you just told me. This is this was part of my power play, okay? Look, the Union guys, they're a rowdy bunch, okay? They're muscle men. What better way can I show my... my... my prowess than helping this poor lady with her issue it's just a little it's just a little side thing we'll do it down the line i've already given my word i'm honor bound honor bound sounds pretty cool but that sounds kind of like a like an excuse the scientist could be connected to our main case that could be true <laughs> i know he tells me don't worry like do whatever you want. And then he's like, sorry, friend. Is that really worth your time right now? Yes. It's just police work. Hmm. It's just a little side thing. We'll do it down the line. If you say so. That sigh is very unappreciated at this time. Oh, thank you, officers. Truly, I'll be right here if you come across any sign of morale. The water lock on the canal is broken, so your husband is probably just stuck on the other side of the coast. That's good intuition. Oh my. What happened to the water lock? Probably just some technical problem? Well, whatever the cause, I'm thankful to both of you. You've spared me another sleepless night. Okay. You're welcome, ma'am. I hate to ask, but if your investigation takes you to the other side of the coast, please do keep an eye out for my husband. I will and do if that. You see him, let him know Lena is waiting for him here at the Whirling. He gets so tangled up in his work that he may not know the water lock's been repaired. And it's cold out there. Um, If I see him, I'll let him know you're here. Oh, okay. you're such a dear. Thank is you, sweetie. Let's, let's find out more. Is he some kind of scientist? Oh, yes. A zoologist. A cryptozoologist, to be more precise. What is a cryptozoologist? It's a pseudoscience that attempts to legitimize research into mythological beasts and urban legends. <laughs> he does sound unimpressed. That's uh, one opinion, yes. And people are entitled to their opinions. Oh, shit. Okay, so there's some tension between... <laughs> uh, 
Kim and Lena, my two loves. Uh, uh, why? Uh, I thought you guys said this was about a, a detective in a murder case. No one told me this was going to be a fucking love triangle. My apologies, ma'am. I did not mean to undermine your hobby. He is just jealous. He's jealous that Lena and I have a budding, trusting friendship and that he and I are still on our first date. <laughs> it's not a hobby, dear. <laughs> it's a subfield of zoology, one specializing in animal species that are so exceedingly rare that many assume them to be extinct or even fictitious. Kim! I can't believe you just called it a hobby. Searching for such species called cryptids is difficult and often thankless. And frankly, many scientists are too lazy to do it. Universities these days are rarely interested in supporting real research. Okay, see, this is this is where the detective work comes in, all right? Lena is looking for the cryptids. Her, her husband, he's a, he's a bona fide scientist, man. He's looking into the mystery of some sort of spectacular insect creature, and he's gone missing. This time, I really do wonder, like, no memes? Like, <laughs> who benefits legitimately? Like, who would, who is trying to stop the discovery of this new species of bug? You, you just gotta, act like, you cannot, you cannot go through this without asking that question. She's completely internalized her husband's struggles. They are her own. Maybe you should convince her to tell you about some cool cryptids. Well, that's, yeah. Now that she's less worried about her husband. Um, tell me more about this rare insect. Oh, sweetie, it's fascinating. But I shouldn't bore you with entomological minutiae. The lieutenant gives you a sideways glance. I don't like that. I don't like being like forced to pick. I want to make Lena happy, but not at the cost of Kim's patience. No, I want to hear about the insect. Kim, this is interesting, okay? This is, the, this is police work. Play along. Well, it's a phasmid, technically, but... Oh, yeah. Here comes the interesting... Where Let's go. other phasmids imitate sticks or leaves, this one's a living reed. It disguises itself among the reeds here on the Insul Indian coast. Okay. Hence its name, the Insul Indian Phasmid. Perhaps you'll end up co-discovering the phasmid with us, officers. I'm sure Kim would enjoy that. There's a touch of awe in the way she enunciated the creature's name. I knew it. We're going to be chasing made-up insects with cryptozoologists. Yes! It's not made up, officer. I can assure you. There's a hint of defensiveness to her retort, but also confidence. She seems to sit up a little straighter in her chair. Uh, there's the power play. It's simply elusive, so much so that most establishment zoologists doubt it exists at all. Uh, um, is it dangerous? <laughs> Not at all. Why else would it hide itself so carefully? Is it valuable? Oh, I doubt it. No one gets into cryptozoology for the money, sweetie. Does it have cool powers, yes. at least? It can blend in almost perfectly among the reeds. It's how it stayed hidden all these years. Centuries, even. Look, okay, aside from, like, whether this thing is real or not, this is all she has. Like, let her enjoy this. What makes you think it's her own Well, hair? some teenagers making out in the reeds saw one. They, they didn't know what it was, of course, but there was a brief article in a local newspaper about their encounter with a ghost insect that looks like the reeds. Gary sent us the clipping. Is Gary real, Lena? Or did you fabricate him as well? Of course, most phasmid sightings turn out to be false alarms, but their description matched the Insul Indian phasmid perfectly, and they didn't even know what they were looking at. Okay, so what's so special oh, about dear. this stick bug? I'm afraid I'm not explaining this very well. It is very special. Ooh, that's painful. That's the worst thing when you're like really excited about something and the, <laughs> you're trying to talk to someone and they just don't care. <laughs> it's... Uh, 
there are some parts of you that are so innocent that are not worth being embarrassed about. You know, if you like something, like, enjoy it, you know, don't, don't, don't feel like you have to censor your enjoyment because of the embarrassment. I'm saying this out loud because that's something I also need to hear myself sometimes. Morel can explain it all much better. I wish you could hear him describe it. Then you'd understand, I'm sure. Tell me about some cool cryptids. There's really no point in manipulating anyone. She'd be only too pleased to tell you about her work. Go on and ask. Hey, Lena, I'd like to hear about some of the cryptids you've studied. Could you just tell me a couple of oh, them? Oh, I'd be delighted. Truth be told, I could really use the company too. One cryptid, not a couple. One. <laughs> this one turned into some kind of cryptid extravaganza. Okay, Kim, just one little cryptid, promise. He nods and assumes a waiting posture. <laughs> uh, I, I love this little triangle. I, I don't know. I don't know why they decided to make the relationships like this, but I'm enjoying it. Cryptids, cryptids. Let's hear about all the interesting cryptids. What's the biggest cryptid? That would be the giant of Kokonur. Okay. The giant lives in the most arid parts of the vast Kokonur desert in South Samara, casting a strange light across the barren wastes. How big is it? No one knows for sure. It is like an awful mountain appearing from below the horizon and expanding to cover almost a third of your field of vision. Is it dangerous? The towering luminosity of Kokonur is a bad omen in local folklore. Some say it's a fata morgana, others fate unimaginable. Who are you? No animal can be that large. It's a mirage. <laughs> That's what makes it so peculiar. A species surviving at the very limits of scientific law. The giant of Kokonur must be the largest animal the planet can support. Let her dream, Kim. There are limits, you see, to how large a metabolism an ecosystem can beget. Some say a gravity anomaly below the Kokonur desert might allow the creature to grow to these gargantuan sizes. So so because the, the folklore doesn't make sense, you also need to like invent a secondary like abstract explanation to justify it. This is interesting. Great. This is great shit. Do you need more? <laughs> yeah. What's the littlest scripted? Just one more. Hey. You promised you'd only ask about one cryptid. But Kim, don't you want to hear about another cryptid? <laughs> right, okay, we can move on for now. It'd be dishonorable to René Jean, a promise. I guess that's true. Look, I'm I'm hanging on for dear life here with Kim. I don't want to disappoint him. He nods approvingly. Okay. Maybe when maybe when Kim is busy, we can come back and hear more about the cryptids, Lena. I'm gonna leave. Lena. Okay. Uh, no more distractions. Um. Okay, let's just... I mean, I guess I don't really need to do any of this stuff first. I can just ask them. Because maybe that'll give me some more direction as well. Let me handle this. Detective disorientated. Are you still wondering where you are? This is Martinez, in case you've forgotten. I advise you not to overstay your welcome. Um, you're the gardener, right? No. I am not a gardener. I'm a legal counselor for the Dock Workers Union. What? You lied to me. So let's get to it. You're looking for Titus Hardy. You think he has information that will help you. Maybe he does. It's she's... <laughs> I've been manipulated That's again. Titus. Talk to him. But know this. I'll be keeping an eye on you. No strong arming. Nothing official. The district of Martinez does not recognize your authority to make arrests. 
What? I can't just arrest anyone? It doesn't that matter I want? if you recognize our authority. We will make an arrest if we have to. It's fucking, that's right, Kim. She says nothing. Her glare speaks for her. Fucking Kim's got my back. Um, you're sure easily have mentioned something about a lawyer, Elizabeth, someone. But you're too dumb to remember what it was. God damn it. My brain is like... It's, it's so poor at detecting simple things. <clears throat> um... What's your role in all of this? How do you benefit? Like I already told you, I'm a legal counselor. Do you have hearing problems? I, I... Look, one thing I am already having a hard time bearing with is how stupid I am. I Like, I do not insult me as well. My My character is very fragile. Like... That's one of the things that I think is like actually really tangible about like what my character would be going through. Becoming a sorry cop, finally facing the the very like negative picture you have of yourself in your own mind. They are evidence that the character is like interested in developing a more realistic view of himself, right? And that's actually something that comes through in this kind of work when I'm talking about, like, the narrative process that I see, right, is you go through identity deconstruction and then reconstruction. And deconstruction looks like listening to feedback, right? Hearing what people have to say, good, bad, critical, praiseworthy, whatever. You're integrating everything. You're you're allowing yourself to be exposed to as many views of yourself as there can be, right? Because the whole issue with narrative is often that like we only view one storyline of our life. And so we want to acknowledge as many as we can, right? Before we start like reconstructing the identity with like something that's maybe not more positive, but is more realistic. Um, so you have to be able to listen to what people have to say about you. You have to be able to integrate that with like what you think about yourself. Harry does not really know what he thinks about himself, but he doesn't like being called stupid. And he doesn't like when people insult him, which is a good sign because it means he is in some ways protective of like who he is being. Um, he doesn't want Kim to think he's too distracted. He doesn't want Lena to think that she is delusional, right? Like the concern that I am having about how people perceive me is evidence of the deconstruction process, right? <laughs> Raise my arms. I mean, I guess that that could be a power play, yeah. <clears throat> what if I want to talk to you, not Titus? I am talking to you. She's going to say, you are talking to me. What you want is of no significance, officer. Don't test your authority. In Martinez, you are no one. Fucking let's go. Authority, chime in. I saw what you were thinking. You want to say, what are you going to do to me? Yeah. Don't. Just because it's in your head doesn't mean you have to say it. Fucking, yeah, right. You will not lose out on anything good by not saying it. Okay, interesting little flip here. Like, authority is being the more reserved, and volition is telling me to say it anyways. What are you going to do to me? Hmm. What Fuck. are we going to do to you? <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Volition, you have steered me wrong. Why did you do this? Asked not to say that. And then you said it anyway. You junior delinquent. But you still did. The union isn't going to do anything to you. It is not a crime syndicate. It is a labor organization. 
<laughs> We're stumbling through every... Look, it's in character. Our guy is like... He's trying to be an authority figure, but he's a total failure at it. We failed with Kuno. We failed with... Joyce. We pretty much failed with Everard Claire. Like... <laughs> and, and we fail here again. Like, it is so within our character to keep doing uh -huh. this. Goddamn right it is. <laughs> we just don't have the intellect. If anything, it is the RCM who do things to people. But we digress. Why are you so aggressive? Aggressive? You make your living enforcing violence. These people are just dock workers. Hmm. So you were spying on us. And now you represent murder suspects. Just dock workers. Listen, you moral intern lackeys. You're a mob enforcing the unlawful privatization of Revishal. Twenty fat men in the Occident are stealing it all, and you're their bodyguards. Fuck yeah. Hmm. So ask what you came to ask, or get back to your commanders. Uh, fuck. This looks like politics stuff. <laughs> um... <laughs> Let's take it a step further. Armed uprising. What are the union's plans? Uh... Yeah, let's ask those questions. <laughs> uh, that's another thing. I'm, I'm, I'm warming it up. I'm warming up to it. Okay, let's do it. All right. This is uh, that was just a test. Okay. What I what I am doing is I'm playing them. I want them to see that I have no game, and now their defenses are not up. This is uh, strategic police work in action. This is where you say your bed. Let's let's keep it together. He's used to giving orders and having them obeyed immediately. You should not indulge him. Okay. Detective. The lieutenant acknowledges you with a sharp note. He's leaving it to you. Precinct 57's finest scans the room, leaving the speaking to you. He trusts you. Maybe against his better judgment, but he does. Okay. I've got Kim's trust. Don't say anything yet. Okay, we've been down this path before. Hey, hey, dipshit. You hard of hearing or something? The boss man's talking to you. Fuck off. Cross your arms. What? Is he fucking kidding? This guy high or something? Hey, asshole, up here. We're talking to you. We are looking for Titus Hardy. Hmm. Nope. We're not gonna we're not gonna feed the troll. We're not gonna get into their attitude. Let's just get straight to the 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 business here. We need to talk about the man hanged out back. Oh, this is about him. A real looker, that one. You sure took your time, huh? Waited for him to get real ripe and pretty for you. Oh, he was a real pretty boy. Hanging up there, letting out that pretty boy smell. I can't for the life of me understand why you did it. I mean... I would have just left him up there. You must really like cleaning up other people's shit. You might want to start asking your questions now. It's not going to get better than this. I don't like These being... These guys are so mad. Uh, They're ready to confess to first degree murder. Ask there's, if it was them. there's too many... There's too many people... I feel like I'm being triangulated. Let's, let's scan the room. Let's get a scope on this. Starting from the right. Boot size, 44. Blonde man, in his 30s. Overbearingly masculine. Okay. Sitting on his right. Standard working boots. Size, 45 or 46. Eldest in the room. Probably mid-50s. Smoker. Quiet. Across okay. at the other table, hobnailed working boots, size 43, gang tattoos, Mesk or Sarah Maritzian in his late 30s, early 40s. Okay. A symmetric burn on his neck, 
resembling the letters Lost Lost. Has he tried to burn it off? Leave that life behind? And then, standard working boot. Steel reinforced <coughs> toes. Size 46. The big dick. Wide at the shoulders and lean at the hips. Rugby cap. Fingerless gloves. And numerous scars. A little under 40. The emblem on his vest says Rowan Club. A little patch below it reads... T. Hardy, Captain, in the far corner, standard working boot, steel reinforced toes, size 44, 40 something, non alcoholic beverage in hand. You squint. Is that a plectrum? What is a plectrum? Where? On his neck. Forget it. It's not important. And a little size 41, with the light step. Not a child, after all. An older man with a rat face, mean, watery eyes, and two front teeth missing. It's the whole gang is here. In the middle, heaving and wheezing. Big guy. Boot size 46. Deep marks. Probably carried the victim over. He alone is 130 kilos. Add the man in armor, and you could easily exceed 220. In conclusion, these seven are the actors on the crime scene. The footprints were theirs, but there's a discrepancy. Can I not just arrest all of them right now? Uh, it seems pretty evident that they did it. It's probably more to the story than that, but I want to exert my authority. Exactly. You've stood there for about four seconds, not saying anything. Hit them with questions. Where's the eighth Hardy? Let's the do fuck it. Is with you, fella. The hanged man in the backyard. Did you do it? Or no, let's just say, let's just go straight for it. I found eight sets of footprints, but there's only seven of you. What are you talking about, madman? There's no eighth hardy boy. There's seven of us and we're all here. Or what? You want to be the eighth hardy boy? We ain't hiring. We could have been. We could have Actually, been. Actually, boss, we've been talking and we think she could maybe... This person Glenn wants to hire. He really respects her. She? So there's an eighth Hardy, and it's a Hardy girl? Who might it be? Elizabeth? The gardener? Could be. Shut the fuck up, Glenn! I do the talking here. Now what the fuck do you want, cop? So let me get this straight. There is an eighth Hardy boy. It's a she, and you don't like us talking about her? That's, that's good insight. That's right. We're not talking about this. This is a private Hardy boys matter. Nothing to do with your shit. M, you're not cops here. Don't go digging around if you don't want a bullet in the back of your head. I'm watching you. Good. We are all watching each other. Officer, your question. There's no point Fucking... in pushing it further, he thinks. This is already a victory. We'll learn more about this eighth hardy sooner or later. All right. That was, a, that was the first good double team. That we've had. It's a fucking power dynamics all over the place. Interesting. What do we got up here? Photos of men in overalls, toting guns and union placards. Oh, there's some money. What do we got here? Okay. All right, we've got some good information from them. Let's see if Elizabeth has anything else to say. I've got nothing to say to you. Why are you wasting your time? Are you the hardy girl? Let's just hit her with the hard questions. I am not. You Fuck. could be Liz. You could be anything. You could even be a model. Even a mod? Glenn, I went to law school. I am an attorney. He's right. With a face like that, she could be on the cover of Le Debutante International. Get a grip, Glenn. She went to law school. Yeah, let's let's uh, divide and conquer. So fucking what? Lots of models are actually really smart people, fuckwad. I, f I hate being insulted like no, that. No, Glenn. They aren't. Ah, fuck. Okay. Don't insult me. I am very fragile. D Lena, get in there and show them. Show them what it means to be a good human. 
Okay. What shall we, uh, let's talk to this guy. What is, what's he got for us? Got any insights? He's seen anything around? It's all about money, you know? <laughs> this guy, this is the who benefits guy right here. That's, he's just sitting around all day. And that's, that's what he's thinking. He goes, he, what? <laughs> what's his story? Let's uh, psychoanalyze him. What's he got? Money is what really matters. They say money can't buy you happiness, but that just means you don't have enough money. You have to invest your money wisely. You can buy stocks with money and those, and then use those stocks to make even more money. That way you'll have enough money when you grow old to make new money. Real estate is the graveyard where tired old money goes to rest. Money is what literally makes the world turn. The laws of money are just the laws of nature. Unpaid labor doesn't net you any money. There is no... I, how many fucking lines of dialogue does this guy have? Money is all about numbers. Money is actually all about trust. It's all about money, you know. Wow. I I am shocked at how many like just ambient dialogue choices this guy has. Okay, it's all about money, is it? Then what has led you, sir, to sitting around drinking all day? Where's the profit motive in that? I think your system is flawed. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let me let me try this out. He's a capitalist, right? That's the money politics. <laughs> I don't know. Let's go see what Kuno's up to. I can go tell Gart that I understand money now. That's true. <laughs> I just have to hit him with the it's all about money, friend. Have you come to make your offering to Kuno? Okay, look, I do want to make up to Kuno, but I can't really give him cigarettes. I think that would be... While it would be amusing, it, our our character is starting to develop a better moral um, path to solving problems. I'll come back when I have something substantial for you, Kuno. I have not forgot about you. Let's take another look at those footprints. What do you here. see? No, we've been through all that. Okay. Um. So I don't have my badge. I can't talk to Joyce. I guess I could ask around about the tattoos. The watermarks. I don't know. Let's. What I should do is actually look at my ledger, right? I had something in here that I didn't I have. Yeah. Can I do something with this? Let's let's try this again. It's the letter you found in the trash. A cabbage of papers hanging from the board with the permeables drawer inside. It's barely held together by a clip, then made complete by the faint smell of urinal cleaner. Okay, so... My odds aren't great. I can always retry, though. Let's try to read the case files first. Yes, at last. You find a way to piece them Fucking together let's go. using the alphanumeric code on the margin. HDB41, date of initialization and time of arrival on the scene, followed by the title. For example, HDB41201117. The next world mural. Uh, weren't those officer precinct? Why, yes. Your precinct number is 41. An HB. Every last alphanumeric in the files begins with it. And these are your case files. It's safe to say HDB are your initials. Harry Dubois. Harry Dubois. HD still feels like there's something missing from that <laughs> i think what you meant to say was rack rafael ambrosius Casto. uh yes i'm ready to give up on rafael he he was a necessary um 
facade. But I'm ready to move on from him. That's comforting to hear. Now, detective, it takes half an hour to piece one of these together. If you still want to. Here are your I want options. To. I want to. Okay, the next world mural. Let's this go. This one is relatively easy to reconstruct. Overnight on 1202, a graffito, nay, a mural, appears on an eight-story tenement overlooking central Jamrock. The building is a sparsely inhabited ghost tower, part of a failed real estate development called Grand Couron. Okay. The mural is enormous. Two silhouettes, a man and a woman, are kissing. The text cut into their form reads, True love is possible only in the next world. For new people, it is too late for us. Wreak havoc on the middle class. <laughs> True love is possible only in the next world. For new people, it's too late for us. Wreak havoc on the middle class. Not sure how those two ideas are really connected. Oh, this could take up my whole day. People call it that thing and that fucking thing. It's visible for miles. In two days, the station's complaints desk gets clogged with requests to remove the bummer. You and your partner are assigned to the case. The graffito crew is easy to track down. Only the bell lectures have the literage of industrial paint to cover the surface. One of the graffito artists is rumored to be rich. They take responsibility for the execution, but not the design. The ideologue of the next world mural as the crew calls it, remains an unknown. Do I ever find out who came up with the it? The case files do not show you finding the author of the design. Okay. The crew agrees to clean up after themselves. However, your partner, JV, is against the removal, citing public support for conservation. This leads to a debate in Precinct 41, which then spreads to the streets of Jamrock, ending in a rare plebiscite organized by you and the rest of row three. The 9,000 okay. people subjected to the mural's message, all of Lakeside, Central Jamrock, and Villa Lobos, plus half of the eminent domain, participate in the vote. Although the case begins with what appears to be a lot of rambling on the streets as to how juvenile and stupid the mural is, given a choice between two options. So I'm to decide basically what happened or Am I guessing what I did? Um, I mean, I'm okay with the the true love is possible part. <laughs> it's kind of poetic. But I'm not sure about the whole wreak havoc on the middle class thing. What I did. Remove the mural. It's wrong. Keep the mural. It is right. I mean, I probably go with what feels right. I would probably remove it just because it's controversial. Someone's going to be mad about that. A staggering 78% of voters choose to keep it. Turns out the opposition were a loud minority. And that love truly is possible in the next world for new people. And it is too late for us. I don't know. I guess all, all that remains is to wreak havoc on the middle class. Someone is going to... I don't know. Someone's going to, like... Don't read into the choices I'm making here. I, I have fucking no idea what this is about, to be honest. I'm just going to choose something. Um, I must have voted and possibly even lobbied to remove the thing because I don't believe in that rubbish one bit. It's human nature. I mean, I think that this is accurate, right? The middle class are not to be blamed. It's human nature. Like, that's a pretty centrist thing to say like that this is not a politically motivated thing it really rip into me <laughs> look i have no fucking clue what i'm i'm gonna make a choice here i have no idea what deeper thing it implies i just don't have if this were like a psychological question i would have more depth to say about it yeah i'm just gonna go centrist It's human nature. Did anyone ask you what you believe in, man with the smelly toilet ledger? What do you want to tackle next? Or are we done? 
I'm going to revisit this. <laughs> <laughs> Good man doing nothing. Not exactly. much has changed in the meanwhile. A bunch of sodden papers still sags from the clipboard. Um, it's pretty in character as well. Like, what is my attachment to these things? I mean, my memory is gone. I don't know if like the person I am right now would make the same decisions um, that prior Harry would have done. Let's see if we can open that compartment. Just relax. The two sides of the board are slightly misaligned, like a drawer that's come off the slides. All you need to do is bend the plastic on your knee, slowly. Okay. The slides snap back into place. It should be possible to just, you know, Slide the drawer open. Without resistance or sound, the two panels move against each other. The compartment is now open. What's inside? Two ticket stubs and a handmade postcard. Okay. What? Pick up the ticket stubs? Two octopuses are smiling, reaching their tentacles toward each other in the colored pencil drawings. The tickets permit access to the zoo in Revachol East. The aquarium costs extra. These let you go there, too. Okay. Pick up the card. Thin wax paper has been glued to a piece of cardboard. Sounds like leaves rustling when you pick it up. You see violet flowers, floral patterns, patches of glue. Smell it it first. smells of chewing gum. Apricot flavored. A touch of cinnamon. The end of summer. You think the label says Tutti Fruity. Let's open it. Familiar handwriting lines the inside of the card. Looped, round letters in a woman's hand. Yes, this is what I wanted. I wanted to know more about whatever relationship that we were in that, like, this is a clear point of major tension in our character's past, right? Like I've been saying for a while that there has to have been probably something um, something that made us very upset with, I don't know, the, the direction our life was taking. And like, that's not to say that the relationship was everything, but a breakup or some sort of like disruption in a, in a major relationship is often a, a catalyst for many other things going wrong that were already going wrong, but that you were withstanding, right? Like if I have a shitty job and I don't like the, the location I live in, but I am really, you know, happy in my relationship. Like there's a lot of stuff I can withstand between those things. But suddenly something starts happening in my relationship it's going to like excuse me it's going to make me um reevaluate how much i'm really able to put up with those other things and i feel like that's probably what happened to us lots of stuff was already going wrong but the relationship really is what kind of set it all off yeah i am having some sort of issue with the chat not only is it not appearing on the screen but i am also like it's like not refreshing for me either something that led us to amnesia inducing heavy drinking yeah let's continue harry it begins you're already reading i wanted to write you a letter so you can read it when you wake up maybe it will make you happy oh shit we actually have something from um from her throw it away please we're gonna keep reading your hand shakes holding the card every morning when i step out and you're asleep behind me it says i find a little piece of sadness in me i carry it in my chest down voyager road every step i take it grows by the time I reach the fuel station, it has filled me entirely. 
I step onto the light rail and look back. Sparks fall from the bow collector. I know it will be like this until late afternoon, when I get off the 42 and walk back to you. Keep reading. You, you. Every step I take will get lighter. It almost makes me run. Sometimes I do. I can't believe I met you. I can't believe the happiness I feel with you. You have a vast, vast soul, and I will always, always, always come back to it. Kisses, kisses, kisses. You feel the air sucked out of your lungs and the blood sucked out of your head. Everything around you gets dark. Small white dots appear. You feel the ledger slip from your hand. No, no, hold on. Uh, we're gonna hold on. To what? There's nothing. Detective, is everything all right? No, Kim, not, nothing is all right. What just happened? Did I die? What? There is nothing. Again. Nothing? Nothing, sir, brother. No treachery. Just blackout. Just lie there. Well, almost nothing. There is the ground below you. That's still there. And the small light that's on, fluttering somewhere in the basal ganglia. Who is that? That's me. Blue eyes. That's me. And who was that? Who was what? He speaks of the sickening longing, the unwell emotion. Even in the darkness, he's grasping for it. Still trying to hold on to the great sorrow slipping in the water. Slimy. No, I was cool. I'm cool. cool. When you're dead, brava. Here in the paleomammalian cortex, we call it the shadow. Because it's always there. Was that the X something? Loaded corpse of the past resurfacing. No, it was beautiful. Beautiful. Believe me, stupid ape. Its lack of beauty was not the problem. Where is Voyager Road? There is no Voyager Road. There are no roads, no houses, no lights in the windows. It's all on. Pause. So my name appears to be your name. Name. Is fuck all. It certainly ain't Harry. Then what is it? The other name is passed out on the ground, dragged around by one of the other evil apes. They're taking you somewhere. Just motionless. You think they would let you? Until you disintegrate into biomolecules. No. Someone is breathing on your face now, inspecting your pupils, stupid idiot. What is that? It's cold. They're pouring something on you. It's in you. And it's... It's delicious. Glowing lights on a dashboard emerge out of nothingness. Oh, shit. Where am I? In the upholstered cabin. Of Lieutenant Kitsuragi's motor carriage. Did he save my life? The driver's basket. The air is thick with leatherworks and heavy fuel oil. Cold water runs down your chin. Volition tried to protect you from this, but you needed to know. That's true. Drink. Water. Oh, Kim saved my life? He saved my fucking life? Drink the water. The water is cold, silvery. The stuff of life itself, as it pours down your parched throat. The pounding in your head recedes. The darkness parts. Drink. You haven't drunk water in two days. Oh, Did shit. Did you know the human body is not made to survive on alcohol alone? You need a secondary form of hydration. <laughs> well, I suspected something like that was true, Kim. With greedy gulps, you down half a liter of cold water. Some of it spills on the driver's seat. 
The lieutenant pays no heed to it. What happened? I came in contact with the burnt out ruins of the past. God, that's beautifully written. I should ask you the same. You were reading your paperwork. Then you passed out. I carried you to my kinema to take you to a hospital. Then you came to. How long was I minutes, out? Maybe. I was dehydrated. I fuck it. Start climbing out of the miracle. I I have I. I'm starting. I'm starting to feel that I can trust Kim to to understand what I am going through, and maybe that it explains some of my behaviors. Let's tell him that we burnt out. That does sometimes happen. You dropped these. Are you okay to proceed? Let's solve this case. Good. The Ledger of Failure and Hatred is a special item that can be used both as an interactable and a tool equipped in your held slot for skill bonuses. Find it under the Tools tab in your inventory. Okay. Okay. There is something that I have been wanting to do. And I think this moment has given me some context that I was hoping to find first before I did this. Let's check out the new thought that I got. White morning. You see yourself from above. You've, you've passed out on the blue tiles of the host, hostel room floor. Even from this distance, you can see your eyelids flutter. The mention of what? A great white object letting out its sweet smell, like a lily of the valley. The little man's forgotten its name, but he still remembers the feeling. And look, he moves. The feeling animates him. It instinctively reaches out for the feeling's best friend, a bottle of Commodore Red. He puts on his disco clothes and gets smaller and smaller. Okay. What I appreciate about this game is that it tends to... Um, it, it gives you stuff like this that's like... I understand it viscerally. Like, I know what the emotional context I'm getting in, but I have no realistic context, which is actually very psychological, right? Like, people either get one or the other. Usually, like, someone is able to give me a very quick history of what, what happened to them, and they can say, yeah, I got in a car accident, and I got hurt, and I was scared, and whatever else but they're they may be missing the visceral emotional part of that and sometimes people are so shocked emotionally that they have a hard time like with the other side of it right like not so much what happened to them but pulling together all of the different pieces of what happened to them for example, Harry is not able to piece together why he was an alcoholic, why he feels so depressed, why he sees the world in terms of power dynamics, why he is so afraid of being seen constantly as pathetic. Like these are not, these are things I can't tangibly point to and say in reality, that's why. And that's what we're discovering through the ledger, through all these different things is we're starting to get some of that context, right? A lot of this speaks to like universal language that we all have about emotions, but we're missing the, the, the context of our life, right? So there's something I wanted to do on my, uh, my whiteboard here. I'm bringing out the Brady board. Okay. For those of you who are longtime viewers of the channel you will recognize this thing that i have in front of me um so this is called a johari window um it's called johari because the guys who invented it were named uh joseph and harrington it's a cool name it's a pretty cool sounding name i i have to admit so the Jahari window is something that I do use in therapy with people. Um, 
for specific things, okay. Um, um, I use the Jahari window for specific things, like when we are doing some of the like uh, identity deconstruction, reconstruction process, when we're trying to learn more about themes and patterns in someone's life, we might use this uh, framework to explore some of that. So like, it's pretty simple how it works, right? This is about understanding how we represent ourselves to the world where we are right now. So there are things that are known to other people and that we know about ourselves, for example, like certain parts of our personality, right? Um, we're going to get into everything that belongs here for Harry, but for example, like he's a cop. He knows that. Everyone else knows that, right? That's not like, that's not an obscured fact about him. So there are things that are known to us and known to other people. There are things that are known to us that are not known to other people. Okay, this is a lot of our emotional conflicts. This is secrets. These are things that we are not super open about yet, right? Then there are things that are known to other people, but are not known to ourselves, right? This is a blind spot. Things that other people intuitively know or think about us that we may not know yet ourselves, right? And sometimes it could be something you've heard before. Like people say I'm a bad cop, right? You may be aware that people think that, but it could still be in your blind spot because it's something known or concluded on by other people, but it's not, we haven't like internalized that yet or gossip. It could be as well, right? So it's a blind spot. And then there is the unknown, which are things that are not known to ourselves nor anyone else, right? And we're going to use this metric to understand Harry Dubois as he exists right now, um, because he's, he's a very fascinating person to use this on, right? Specifically because he is someone with memory loss, um, but also because we are on this path of like self-discovery and we're not sure exactly how we feel about those things. So like from the very beginning, right, we can see that we are a cop, but we're not sure like, are we a good cop? Right? That's 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 something that's unknown to us. And other people don't really know this either. I mean, I'm sure that's there's some some opinions about it, right? But it doesn't seem like we've internalized that there is a, a conclusion made about this yet, right? So some things that are known to us and known to other people are our, um, I'll just put addictions, right? We are clearly struggling with substance use. Um, what is known to others is that we are, uh, let's say like struggling with intelligence. We're lacking intelligence. That's something that we are also observing um, other things that other people know about us that we also know is that like we're struggling. We're struggling emotionally. We're struggling physically, right? we're struggling with all kinds of stuff. So so these are some of the things that that people do know about us and we'll we'll keep building that, but I want to put something in each category first, right? So something that is not known to other people but known to ourselves, right, is like our sense of shame. The reason I'm putting this here and not known to others, even though we have definitely made some shameful actions, is like we're trying everything we can to protect this from moving up here, right? And that's kind of 
more so about what goes in these categories is we use this to understand where things move as you make decisions and asking the question, okay, well, what does it mean to you that having shame about this, like people know you're a cop, but you're not sure if you're a good cop. You're not sure if you made good decisions before you blacked out. You're not sure if you actually have the intuition to solve this case. Those things give you shame. And so what you do with that shame is you try to present yourself as an authority. You try to present yourself as intelligent and you're failing at those things, right? Um, we're trying to use authority. And so the question we have about being a good cop it's leading to a sense of shame. And to protect this from entering the arena, which is where things are observable to everyone, right? We're trying to act out this behavior. We try to use authority to like minimize people's observation of this quality because we're afraid, you know, they'll discover that this is we're we're afraid that this will no longer be an unknown and it will become known to everyone that we are a bad cop, right? So, so this is about understanding patterns of behavior and themes more so than a lot of other things, right? That's something that we can point to because like my client may come in and say, well, I don't know why I'm, I keep getting into all these power struggles with Kuno and Elizabeth and Claire and Joyce and that sort of thing. And it's like, okay, well, very simply, we were able to discover what the relationship between these things are and why there is a protectiveness over that, right? So we're trying to use authority. There is definitely some shame that we have. Um, there's a little bit of our past that belongs kind of like in both of these, right? We're sort of starting to learn more about who we were. Let's do that. But we're not like sharing it openly a lot, right? We're not discussing frequently like what we just saw in the dream sequence or what we saw on the ledger. We didn't immediately tell Kim uh, what we thought about it, right? And I think that we're not sure about ourselves our view of self is kind of a mystery, right? It's something that we're not, we're not sure what we think about ourselves yet. All we know is that we, we definitely have some shame. There is definitely some, like I see it going this way where because we, we have a, questionable past and we have we're not sure what we think about ourselves as a cop we're already assuming that we regret a lot of what we did and we're we're bringing those regrets up here which is that we're sorry right this has been a big part of like reconciling the confusion about the past is that we don't even know exactly what we did with all of our decisions. And so what we're doing is trying to preemptively apologize because uh, we just assume that we have regrets about this. Our, our shame, this shame is like driving this motion very strongly, right? And so we can actually identify shame as like one of the, one of the driving emotions of all of our behaviors right now, right? Because we can look at this and say, yeah, we're, we're not totally sure about um, our past. We can see that the way people look at us about our addiction, about our lacking of intelligence, and e even the way Lena talks to us, that she's like so soft-spoken and Kim is so like, um, he's kind of like, he lets us be on training wheels. Like we, in we internalize that and we can see that people are treating us a very different way. Like they're almost, they, they, I think other people can see how fragile we are in a way that we sort of can't, right? Uh, 
Um, we're not actually totally sure how fragile we are. We're not sure that if you pushed us in a certain direction, we like what our limit is. And I think that that's something that other people can kind of see, right? Lena is so soft-spoken with us and Kim kind of puts training wheels on us because they sort of can tell what's going to happen if we start getting too involved with our own feelings, right? If we start looking more into this area. And it's evident that like what we just experienced is is learning a little bit more about this, right? Our fragility sort of moved in this direction because we looked at something in our past, right? When we when we learn about the past, our fragility sort of like becomes known to us. And in this case, it became known to someone else as well, right? Um, it became known to Kim. And we may find in future interactions that he's, he tells us like, maybe you shouldn't look into your past so much because it's harmful to you and it could disrupt the case, right? And so learning about our past, what does this do to us? What does it mean to discover that we are actually quite fragile? Well, it could lead to us trying to use more authority to sort of pump ourselves up and show other people that we are not so fragile. And what that would be doing is trying to, we're, we're, we're trying to make our past and this fragility become like secretive. We're trying to remove other people's ability to see this because it, it lowers our chances of sort of convincing them that we're legit, right? So so that's the kind of avoidance that I'm seeing. It's like we're when we are when when we're using the Jahari window, we might start looking at some of this and say, okay, well, you're scared of people discovering this. You're scared of discovering it yourself. And so what behaviors are you doing to force things down here? When you see things moving a lot in this direction and concentrating in the facade, you can call that avoidance pretty clearly, right? We can call this like self-defense. We can call it trying to control the narrative about how people see you. Um, that's a very common pattern, right? If we see things concentrating somewhere else though, right? For example, before the story started, it is clear that a, a sense of shame and regret and fragility were known to us. These could have all been things that existed here. And so drinking alcohol and, you know, pushing ourselves to the limit could have been an attempt to move things here to sort of erase ourselves and erase our view of ourselves because this is something that we are not happy about. And so when we are interested in reevaluating something, like, for example, you know, that we are struggling, sometimes we try to move it here, right? Because we, we don't want to, we, we want to deconstruct it, right? Are we really struggling, right? We want to understand, like, is that something that we're really struggling with? And we want to remove it from other people's perception, right? So things can sometimes concentrate this way. They can sometimes concentrate that way. What I see more about the rigorous self-critique, though, when I think about what that means thematically, is like a lot of the motion that we're seeing is really more so like this, right? We are invested in learning what's in our blind spot. What do people think about us, right? We are, what, what manipulates us? What are some of the desires that we have that we may not even be aware of that other people are aware of, right? 
someone in the chat asked like where would you put desires honestly i would probably say um it's in the blind spot because we're not sure what we want yet right we're it's not like we know exactly we're not entirely sure if we want to engage with our past that's why we haven't looked in the mirror it's not totally unknown because other people can observe our behaviors and see, yeah, well, you you spent a lot of time looking for cigarettes. You spent a lot of time, you know, trying to get alcohol or whatever. Um, and so desires feels to me like it's it's here. And that's why manipulation works so well on us, right? Because it is it's our blind spot. We don't we don't even know what's really gonna trigger us, right? Our face is definitely in the blind spot. Definitely, right? Some amount of our identity is like sort of moving like that. Like it, our identity is is becoming known to us, but the more we learn about it, a lot of times we don't like things moving directly from blind spot over this way because we haven't been able to decide privately what we feel about it. We are much more comfortable moving things like this way because it passes through like, okay, well, you know, let's, let's remove people's awareness to that thing, decide how we feel about it, and then maybe I'll show it to the world, right? But our identity is kind of like move in the reverse in my opinion right it's it's becoming known to other people and ourselves at the same time we sort of reflect privately on what we think about it but then the more we learn like for example that there's a relationship one which we are very heartbroken about like we've we've suddenly learned about it but it's also unknown to us like no one else really knows about this either but what i was saying was we have all these things right and what i see a lot of what i see happening a lot is things converging in the arena here right and it's called the arena because like this is where your qualities receive the most critique, challenge, feedback, right? Um, it's where things are observable to you and to other people, and they are really put through their trials for like how central they are to your identity, right? For example, like the whole thing with Kim and my my discovery of some of my unknown biases, like they went like this, right? Like Kim's cultural background was a blind spot to me. Like I had the wrong read on him. When I learned about that, I tapped into maybe what some of my unknown biases are, right? Um, and sort of brought them to the arena. Like I, I shared them with you all. And that's what I see Harry doing, right? Like the more you make this motion and the more you try to bring things here, the more invested you are in like facing your problems, you know? And, and I see that in the way he is apologizing a lot, right? Being a sorry cop to me is about alleviating this sense of shame because we can't change this. We can't change our past. We can't change what we did, but we can try to change what it means to us, right? And the more we learn about our past, the more we're able to apologize for what we did, the more we're able to apologize for what we did, our identity does become more clear to us because we see it as a growth of moral character, which slightly reduces the amount of shame that we have and makes us feel much more like 
we are a good cop, right? That's also coming up this way. And what happens to our view of self when we apologize and we see that feedback from other people, right? It also improves somewhat, I think, to other people first and then to ourselves, right? So I know this looks like a mess. Uh, Jahari window always does, <laughs> like, because we're we're looking at patterns, we're looking at behaviors, and we're trying to understand, like, okay, if this is the the machine that's driving a lot of this, we need to understand why this is so important to you, and that doing this right here, trying to use authority to protect people from finding out that you're fragile or manipulatable is not reducing the shame, it's actually making it worse. What's actually reducing the shame is the apologies, right? And the positive feedback that you get from them. So Harry's development is very much like this motion right here, right? So it's interesting. This is something we'll return to the more we learn about him because there's so much stuff here, right, about his past. And there's so many things we're probably not even aware are in our blind spot. But yeah, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna keep this uh, in view as we continue building out our, our view of Mr. Harry. Thank you for watching my video. If you enjoyed it, consider giving it a like and letting me know what you thought of it in the comments. You can subscribe to catch the next video here, or you can see things a little bit earlier if you support the channel either through Twitch or Patreon. Links to both of those and the community Discord are in the description. Thanks again, and I will see you next time.